This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Tuesday, April 7th, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. Spending trillions of dollars in that recent federal coronavirus relief package demands at least oversight. So how will it work? Cato's Will Yateman has gone over what the legislation demands. We spoke yesterday. What Congress passed to spend this $2 trillion, which is, you know, it's hard to overstate what a huge amount of money uh, this was, uh, especially when you consider that the the federal government spends about four trillion dollars a year in a year. Uh, so, what was built in uh, to this legislation with respect to oversight? A great deal, actually, and this is something that the House majority, and that is to say, the Democrats in the House and Democratic leadership in particular, Nancy Pelosi, um, that they fought for, and they're to be commended for this. Um, oversight is never so important as during times of stimulus. I mean, the whole idea behind a stimulus is to rush as much money out the door as fast as possible. Um, That presents two distinct dangers. The first is haste makes waste, as the old adage goes. I mean, mean, we sort of learned this from the last stimulus about a decade ago in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, and the, the second potential problem is that of politics. Um, if this stimulus is a black box administered by the Trump administration, who's to say that they wouldn't do something like uh, uh, disproportionately invest these stimulus resources, or not invest, but give them away um, to people in swing states and thereby make a, a bolster their political prospects for the upcoming, the Trump administrations for the upcoming election. So uh, coterminous with stimulus is this urgent need for oversight. And Dems fought for this. And, and they actually, they fought for three layers of oversight in this bill. And, and in particular, what they focused on was the 550 odd billion dollars that are going to be uh, in loan guarantees to big business, uh, but also 350 billion dollars worth of loans administered um, or given by private parties, but administered by the Small Business Administration. Um, so we're talking, you know, about a trillion dollars of public money here. And, you know, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, so what they did is, again, these three layers. And two of them were housed in the executive branch. So here there was a council, sort of an oversight council um, for how these monies are spent. Uh, There was also a a special inspector general, sort of an all-purpose investigator um, in the Treasury Department in particular. So these were the two executive branch measures. Um, And there was a third, uh, which was a congressional oversight committee comprised of of, of members chosen um, on a bipartisan basis and and with an independent staff and resources um, potentially to, to investigate, to oversee this spending. So what happens? We've got these three layers. Trump signs the law um, and, you know, into enactment um, to much fanfare. Uh, shortly thereafter, a couple hours later, the Trump administration issues a so-called signing statement. And, and this is this outrageous process, this uh, constitutional abomination, um, in my humble opinion, whereby, uh, uh, you know, we've all seen the commercial how a bill becomes a law. You know, a bill survives Congress, it gets to the president's desk, he signs it, but then thereafter he says, my signature, notwithstanding the fact that I just, my signature is a part of this constitutional process that makes this bill into a law, um, nevertheless, I'm not going to respect, I'm not going to implement or abide certain provisions of the law with which I disagree, these so-called signing statements. So Trump signs the CARES Act, and that's an acronym. I mean, I can't tell you exactly what the letters mean. I know the first one's coronavirus, um, but he he signs the CARES Act. And then shortly thereafter says, hey, these two oversight provisions that were housed in the executive branch for this stimulus, I'm not going to abide those. Um, In particular, he objected to the extent to which Congress could consult in the the appointment of a director for this uh, council and the extent to which the... uh, Treasury Department Inspector General could tell Congress that the Trump administration wasn't playing ball, that they weren't giving up the necessary information to allow for oversight. Um, So Trump says, hey, these two layers, I'm not going to do them. And and 
I personally, I find that outrageous. I think all these, uh, any signing statement is, um, uh, again, a constitutional abomination. But this one, given the context, given the importance of oversight in the stimulus context, um, I think it's, it's, it's pretty outrageous. Which brings me to the point of an op-ed that I wrote, I guess it was published last Friday for the New York Daily News, um, in, in which I note, I lay out sort of this history, but also point to what Congress can do about it. Um, and, and in particular, they ought to beef up this third layer, this Congressional Oversight Committee. They ought to generously fund its staff. They ought to use this mechanism known as detail, um, by which they force executive branch employees to come work for Congress. Um, but they ought to go all out. Uh, they ought not take the president's signing statement uh, sitting down, if you will. It, it really is outrageous. I mean, c- Congress has a you know, the president executes the law, but the Congress has a plenary, sort of unbound almost power to investigate how these monies are spent. I mean, you know, Congress is the one who, who passed the law that spends these money, these monies. Congress is the one that passed the law that creates the agencies uh, that spends these monies. I mean, th- there, there's no sort of constitutional case at all, really, um, to deny Congress a, 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 a role um, in this oversight process of, of the stewardship of these public funds. So I'm all for it. My, my only fear would be, um, you know, one that it sort of applies to all contemporary current events, uh, which is to say that the, the leadership in the House um, is perhaps more interested in, in scoring political points than it is in true oversight. I mean, and I would, I'll say this, true oversight leads to legitimate political points. I mean, if, if you do your, your homework and, and do a good job with the oversight, then, you know, potentially you uncover all sorts of shenanigans that, that make for great campaign commercials. Um, that truth notwithstanding, sometimes politicians are given to the, perhaps uh, the easier way out, if you will. Um, I, I just hope it doesn't become I hope they take this commission seriously. In a perfect world, it would be bipartisan. I mean, this is something that would engender support across both aisles. So that the president effectively slapped, uh, constitutionally slapped Congress in the face with his signing statement. Um, so uh, I, in this op-ed, in the New York Daily News, I just lay out the case and, and for Congress to take this oversight um, commission within Article 1, within the legislature seriously, to fund it well. Um, and to uh, uh, be a, a proper steward of, of these public monies. Presidents have used these signing statements for at least the last 18, 19 years. Um, do they have, do they hold up at all? Are they used when these kinds of things are challenged? It, it depends. I mean, you hit the operative concept with that last bit, uh, when they're challenged. Uh, the problem is this is a prototypical, um, what is known as a quote-unquote political question. And that is a fancy term in constitutional law for uh, the sorts of controversies that courts refuse to take on because it is best left to the political branches. Um, which is to uh, say it is best left to the voters, um, uh, ultimately, you know, who would take a side in, in such a, a controversy between the elected branches, between Congress and the president. Uh, l- long story short, it, it's a tough question to answer because there's rarely a way to tell. These are uh, what is known as non-justiciable controversies generally because, again, they're, they're, uh, they fall under this doctrine, this rubric of so-called um, political questions. And, and courts are reluctant to weigh in on these sorts of questions, these sorts of contribu- uh, constitutional controversies um, between the political branches. But basically, when a controversy in- involves the constitutional functions of the elected branches of government. So here the constitutional function is Congress, you know, passes the law, both chambers of Congress, um, and then the president's constitutional function is, you know, he's got to sign or veto the law. Um, when it's that sort of controversy at play, courts don't touch it with a 10-foot pole. They rely on this, this doctrine um, of, of judicial restraint, this political questions doctrine. So uh, that is an unsatisfying answer for um, ultimately these controversies in our system tend to be decided by voters at the polls at the subsequent congressional or presidential election. Will Yateman is a research fellow at the Cato Institute. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast wherever you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast.